Church, um, if you did not hear, if you did not get the, the memo, um, we are delaying the business meeting and uh, fellowship lunch and Lord's Supper one more week. Um, after I said it was delayed for a week last week, I found out that our treasurer and one of our elders wouldn't be able to be at the meeting, so I can't carry it. So, um, so, so we're going to do it next week, God willing. Um, so plan on coming. If you've already signed up uh, for bringing something, if that has changed at all because of the timing, let Monica know. Um, if you still want to sign up, the sign-up sheet I think is on my desk still. So uh, just go sign that and... Um, other than that, I, I just want to encourage all of you be there, um, whether you're a member or not of the church, uh, be there for the fellowship meal. Um, and then if you want to stick around for the business meeting, you can. It's just where we approve the budget for the year now that we're three months into the year. <laughs> and uh, and it'll, be, it'll be great. Um, we've got uh, one more day. Today is the last day of our prayer week. Um, so we're going to watch a video real quick about uh, the, the North American Mission Board and how our funds are used, and then we're going to pray uh, for them, and then we'll get started with our worship time. When you and your church give, you send hope. In small towns, big cities, and college campuses, God uses your sacrificial giving and your partnership with the North American Mission Board to make this happen over and over again. And at NAM, we think it's important for you to know how God uses your gifts to produce results. Southern Baptist churches like yours fund North American missions through two primary sources. First, the cooperative program. Your gifts to the CP typically come from your church budget and then go directly to your state convention. Each state then sends a portion of that money to the SBC Executive Committee, and from there, more than half of CP goes to the International Mission Board. NAM, SBC seminaries, and other entities receive a percentage as well. NAM receives 22.79% of cooperative program dollars. We use those funds to support evangelism events, to support ministry centers and missionaries, to endorse chaplains, and for operations. Altogether, those funds make up 35% of our budget. But the largest part of NAM's budget, 50%, comes from the Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. More than 100 years ago, this offering was named for a bold missions advocate who rallied SBC churches in support of missionaries. Today, Southern Baptists have thousands of missionaries serving in North America. They are spreading the gospel through Sin Network, our church planning arm, and Sin Relief, our evangelistic compassion ministry area. And when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering through special offerings, your church budget, or directly to NAM, you're helping these missionaries by providing the fuel to assess, train, coach, and care for them. It helps pay for things like Bibles, curriculum, ministry equipment, or even rent for a worship facility. Some churches may refer to this offering as the North America Missions Offering or something else. Whatever you choose to call the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, it is unique because every dollar goes directly to support missionaries where the need and the opportunity are the greatest. It goes all over North America, including our largest, most influential cities where the gospel presence has been on the decline. Your giving helps plant new, reproducing churches. And now, in many urban areas, we're starting to gain ground. It goes to places like international and refugee communities where tens of thousands of people, many from countries close to the gospel, move every year. Your giving is sending missionaries to love them and share the hope of Christ. In a hundred different ways, in a thousand different places, all of your gifts are enabling missionaries to start new churches, baptize new believers, and make disciples. That's how your giving works. As you pray and give, we at the North American Mission Board are so grateful to be your partner, helping you fulfill the Great Commission. Together with you and your church, every day we are sending hope. All right, so uh, if you weren't here last week, we did pass out these uh, prayer guides. There's still some on the table out there if you want to take one home. Uh, this was prayer week. Uh, this is the last day of prayer week, but these are, are good to be prompts for your prayer 
any, any day in any week of the year. Um, the, the last day of prayer week says, United in Prayer. And the, it has a quote saying, we had been asking people to pray for quite some time for someone to reach the, Arama uh, the Arabic-speaking population in our area, said Cincinnati pastor Travis Smalley. God sent Amir and Vicky Sadafi, and now Arabic-speaking people in Cincinnati and around the world are hearing the gospel. That's what prayer can do. It says, millions of Southern Baptists, like you, have faithfully prayed this week for the featured missionaries, for their families, for their churches, and their communities. They are only a few representatives of a larger missionary force because of your faithful prayers and giving every day. Throughout the North America, there are thousands more workers reaching people across the divides of culture, language, and ethnicity with the gospel. Your prayer support is the vital engine of their ministry. Prayer isn't the least you can do, it's the most. Your prayers for North American missionaries are powerful, and they don't have to end this week. Um, if, you, if you have one of these, it has a website, and the North American Mission Board's prayer resource PrayForPlanters.com gives you the opportunity to meet and pray for missionaries in every state and province, and you can send notes of encouragement and join a missionary's prayer team. Um, we want to uh, we want to pray for all of the church planters. We we want to pray specifically for the church plant in Indianapolis that we support through uh, their their Nam Church Plant um, Refuge Bible Church. Uh, we want to pray uh, for them. And I also want to just encourage you to keep praying for our Christian brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Um, there's, uh, if, if you didn't, if you have Facebook, I shared some videos of, of Ukrainian Christians gathered for worship three weeks into a war. Um, and there's video on there, and, it, and they're singing in Ukraine. I don't know what they're singing, but it's still, like, it, it just gripped my heart to see this this devotion to God and to one another and this devotion to uh, serving him and, and, and worshiping him even in the roughest times. And uh, I think that's an encouragement for us to, to say, okay, nothing should stop us. Nothing should stop us from worshiping our Lord. So let's pray. And, uh, and then we're going to get into a time of worship. Uh, we worship at Warsaw Baptist Church in three primary ways, in our giving, in our singing, and in the preaching and hearing of God's word. If you uh, are a visitor, don't worry about the giving part. That's for the longtime visitors and members of the church. Uh, but for the rest of us, we are all going to sing, and, uh, and we will hear the word preached. Father God, we love you so much. We are so grateful for the love and care and compassion that you poured into our lives. Lord, while we were still sinners, you came and died for us. While we were still sinners, you sent Christians into each of our individual lives so that we could hear and trust the gospel. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would just continue that work. We, we pray for a great awakening, not just here in Warsaw or here in Kentucky, but across the nation and across the globe, we ask for your name and your fame to be made great everywhere. Lord, I ask that uh, as we get into this time of worship that we recognize the privilege of, of gathering together. I pray that you'd help us to recognize the privilege of gathering together and, 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 and that have a knowledge of, of the fact that we are gathering with saints across the globe right now. Lord, right now there are walls and nations and borders dividing us, but, but one day we will all be before your throne. And until that day, I pray that you would protect and care for each of the believers who come to you. Lord, I pray that even in this time of, of hardship in our nation, of war in other nations, I pray that you would continue to draw people to yourself, help them to see you as the answer to every problem. And Lord, as we worship now, help us to worship in spirit and truth. Help us to worship with, with hearts that are, that are just on fire for you, Lord. And Lord, help us to do all these things for your glory. It's in Jesus' perfect and precious name that all God's people said, amen. All right, let's sing. Hey, good morning. Good morning. We'll stand with us. We'll get started.
Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. I love that song. Um, we're going to uh, release the kids to Children's Church and the little kids to nursery. Uh, thank you to Tracy and Jenny for, for volunteering for that today. Uh, thank you for everybody who does bring their kids here. It's a, it's a great thing to, to see all these happy little faces. Uh, let's pray for them, and then we'll release them. Father God, we love you, and we thank you so much for your love. Lord, we are all to be like children. Not childish, but childlike. Coming to you with our trust and our devotion and our worship. We are to come to you excited to see you like, like a, a child is happy to see their parent after the parent's been away. Lord, I pray that you would bless these children that we're sending off to nursery and to children's church. I pray that you would bless them with, uh, with, with knowledge of you, with faith in you, and joy in their hearts, Lord. Be with our volunteers. Lord, thank you for the volunteers who keep this church running. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just continue to bless them and keep them and motivate them uh, in the way that they uh, serve here. It is, it is such a privilege to serve beside them. Father God, we ask that as we stay here, as the adults uh, stay here and listen to your word preached, we pray that you would give us receptive hearts as well. And Lord, as we all go out from here today, help us to go out as disciple-making disciples. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kids can go. And everybody else, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Psalm 124. Psalm 124, it should be near the middle of the Bible. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, there should be a hardbacked blue one in the pew near you. Um, if you're in the pew Bible, it's on page 517. There's eight verses here. And uh, I know I still sound a little sick, but I feel so much better than I have for the last two weeks. So thank you all for praying for me. Uh, pray that my voice holds. Um, I, was, uh, I was in my office earlier today, and I was watching another church service just worshiping with their band, and uh, then I realized I can't do that if I'm going to preach today. So, so, and then I was getting into the worship here, and I was like, I can't do that if I'm going to preach today. So, so uh, just pray that my voice uh, carries, but, uh, but I do feel tremendously better than I did. So thank you. Our family is all uh, on the mend, and, and we all have a, a cough that's a little worrisome, but, but it's, it's still nothing compared to what it was. What it was. So uh, thank you for your prayers. If, once you're to Psalm 124, please stand for the reading of God's word. We don't want to show reverence to the God who gave us the word, but also just to push away the distractions that we might have come in here with. Psalm 124, verses 1 through 8 says, if, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Verse 6, blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, you, you are an amazing God. You have rescued us from so many dangers. You have rescued us from so many uh, dangers that have come from without, and sometimes we can confess dangers that we brought upon ourselves. Lord, the fact that we are standing here today in this room together is evidence of your sustaining, persevering grace. Lord, help us to never take it for granted. Help us to always be enthralled and amazed by what you've done. Lord, I know that we have 
some family from this church who are, who are sick, who are not feeling well, help them to know that you will carry them through to the end. Help my brother Sean, who is still trying to figure out uh, his medicine and stuff with his diabetes. Please help Jessica Beach as she's, uh, she's enjoying the, the first months of pregnancy. And uh, Lord, help all those who are not able to be here with us. Help them to know, help us to know that you have carried us. You will carry us to the end. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. So the history of the people of Israel is astonishing. It's astounding. It's awe-inspiring. When we look at the history of Israel, we should look at it with our mouth agape. What in the world? How in the world are they even here? The history of Israel is astonishing in that there are still Israelites. The history of Israel is astonishing that there are still Jewish people in the world There's a writer named Walker Percy who said this. He said, where are the Hittites? If you don't know, Hittites were one of the people groups in the Old Testament. He says, where are the Hittites? Why does no one find it remarkable that that in most world cities today, there are Jews, but not one single Hittite? Even though the Hittites had a great flourishing civilization, While the Jews were nearby in comparatively weak and obscure circumstances, when one meets a Jewish person in New York or New Orleans or Paris or Melbourne, it is remarkable that no one considers it remarkable. It is amazing that nobody considers it amazing. But it's even more remarkable to wonder, if there are Jews here, why are there not Hittites? Where are the Hittites? Show me one Hittite in New York City. He's amazed. He's astounded. We should be amazed and astounded that Jewish people exist. If you know the history of the Jewish people in the Bible and in our day, you should be amazed that they have been able to exist. The Jewish people were called as a family by this this one patriarch, Abraham. Remember? And from Abraham... Just a couple generations later, we have Jacob and Esau. Do you know what happened? Esau wanted to kill Jacob. And yet God preserved Jacob. And he lived. And then just a little while later, there was this man named Joseph, a descendant of Abraham and Jacob. And his brothers wanted to kill him. But then they decided, no, we're just going to sell him into slavery. But he's gone. But God preserved Joseph. And then, while Joseph is being preserved as a slave in Egypt, God decides, I'm going to send a famine on the entire region. And if, any, and if, if things don't go well, everybody's going to starve to death. Including God's people. And yet God preserved the people through Joseph. And this vision of the famine to come and the the knowledge and the wisdom to know what to do. And then, things are going great for a while. But then another pharaoh comes in control of Egypt and he does not have favor on the Jewish people. He enslaves the Jewish people. As the Jewish people start to grow as as a people, he says... These numbers are making me nervous. Let's just kill all the, all the boys that are born. And so he put out this edict to, to kill all the boys. And yet God preserved them. And the more they were pressed down, the more they multiplied. So God delivers them out of this slavery. He continues to preserve them. And then he takes them into the wilderness to go to the promised land. And as if all the other problems they had weren't enough, when they're in the wilderness wanderings, they sin against God. 
to where God says, Moses, just, just move aside. I'm going to kill them all and start over with you. And Moses, God's mouthpiece, he says, God, remember, you gave Abraham your word. They're not worth it, but you gave your word. Amen? We can all say that about ourselves. Don't save them because of them, but because of your great mercy, your grace, your promise. And so God did preserve them and got them into the promised land. And then if you read the book of Judges, we find the, the Israelites finally in the promised land. Joshua has helped them get into the promised land. They've cast out a lot of the, the, the other people who are living there. And then in the book of Judges, it says that the people of God turned away from God. And they didn't follow anyone's lead, and they did what was right in their own eyes. And the story of Judges, if you read the book, it is just horrible. Like, it's, it's not one you want to read to your kids. It, is, it just goes from bad to worse as they do whatever is right in their own eyes. And every time they turn against God, God allows them to feel what it's like when he's not present. And yet, he pers- preserves them. And yet he holds them and carries a remnant through those years. And then God gives kings. But then Israel, because they're like us, they start disputing with each other. And then we have years and years and years of civil war. And then after this divided kingdom is divided, it's divided and then conquered by all these other nations and all the Jewish people are taken into exile. While they're in exile, there's this guy named Haman. I don't know if you've read this story of Esther. But there's this guy named Haman who who says, you know what, I want to kill all those Jews. And so he goes to Xerxes. Artaxerxes, Xerxes. He goes, he goes to the king, and he says, hey, can you, can you make this a law that on this day we can kill all the Jews? And the guy's like, the king's like, yeah. It's just a people group. He didn't care. Again, there was nothing going in their favor until God flipped the script, and then all of a sudden he made this day that was supposed to be their downfall a day of great victory. It's what they still celebrate at Hanukkah. But then... The Romans come. I'm skipping through a bunch of other ugh, terrible stuff. But then the Romans come. They oppress them. And in 70 AD, they destroy the temple, every stone taken down from another. Jerusalem is leveled. They're scattered. The, the Christian church has some embarrassing and sorrowful history about how we have treated the Jews. There are times in the Crusades where we massacred whole villages of Jewish people. That happens, if you wonder why that happens, because the people at that time were not reading the Bible. They understood some things about God and they ignored all that he had told us. And so they said, yeah, we should just kill him. And then after we got done, Islam grew and the Islamic Forces came and massacred Jews. And the reason they did is because they read their Quran and it said, kill the infidels. And the Jews survived thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Reason after reason after reason that you should see no Jewish people. And then we get to the 20th century. Some of you are too young to remember the 20th century. We get to the 20th century, and between the Russians and the Germans, so many Jews are killed that, again, it is amazing that they exist. And after the World War II, the UN establishes a nation, Israel. Now, what they did is they just gave them the land that was theirs from all the way back in Judges. They established this nation, and on the day that they were given independence as the state of Israel, every surrounding country started attacking. Every surrounding country. 
established countries. Transjordan, Egypt, Syria, they all just jumped in. And God didn't let those other countries win. And Israel stayed a state. And they fought back. And I would like to say that was the first and only Arab-Israeli war, but no. Over and over, they've had to fight off these other nations. In the 70s, there was what they, they called the Six-Day War. Now, I am too young to remember that, but I read about it. And again, they should have been toppled. And yet, God preserved the Jewish people. When we look at the history of the Jews, we should be amazed. And when we look at this psalm, we see this psalm is a psalm of David. Do you see that? Right underneath the psalm, it says a song of a sense of David. This is a psalm of David where he is just writing out and singing out and telling everybody, it is amazing how God has preserved us. Now, if you just look at David's life up to the point where he was crowned king of Israel and Judah, it's amazing that he ever got to that point. Because again, if you look at David's life, you find out that when he was a shepherd, he had to fight off, he had to fight off bears and lions. Like, I, I look at David's life, and every, every check mark, I'm like, that would have killed me. I see a bear, I'm not fighting it. He fought off bears and lions to protect the sheep. He fought off a giant named Goliath that had, was so terrifying that every soldier in Israel were quaking in their tents in fear. And he said, but we have God. I'm not going to let this uncircumcised Philistine talk to me and my God like that. And he killed him with a stone and a sling. And then <laughs> Saul, the king of Israel, who should have been pro-David, right? He should have been like, David is the guy. I, I said, David, we win every time. But he got jealous. So he started trying to kill David, hunting him down, throwing spears at his head. He was trying to kill David, and David was on the run for years. When he was on the, on the run, there was this one time when the Amalekites came and, and took him, or took his uh, wives and all of his, his, his other soldiers, families, and kidnapped them, and he had to go and get them. He was finally crowned king of Judah, and then this one guy didn't want him to be the king, so he said, no, I'm going to take Saul's son, and make him king over the rest of Israel. So you can have Judah. We're going to have Israel. And so it was years before they were finally putting him in the throne above all of Israel. So when, when David writes this, hear in his voice astonishment. Hear in his voice, look at it. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side... And then he just tells everybody, let all of Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. David could look back in awestruck wonder that he and Israel existed. Now, I wonder if you've lived long enough to have a similar kind of hindsight. Have you lived long enough? Do you recognize areas in your life where when you look back, you're like, I shouldn't be here. Do you have those times? Do you have those times in your life where you're like, I should be dead or in prison? There's no way I should be here. I have those times. Two weeks ago, I celebrated 21 years of sobriety. 
Don't, don't clap. God's grace, God's grace. 21 years ago, two weeks ago and 21 years ago, I was on the, the fifth floor of Darnell Armory Hospital. You know what the fifth floor is? The mental ward. Because I could not get dried out enough, and I was shaken and kind of crazy, and they had to get me dried out before they could send me to rehab. 21 years ago, I was the guy who, if, if you were in the motor pool with me while I was in the Army, you would have said, oh, Ken's over there. We'll go over there. You, know, it, it, you just didn't want to be around me. I was, I was obnoxious and lazy and just an idiot 21 years ago. I did all kinds of things in that, those years of my drinking that break my heart because of the sin against other people and the sin against God. Looking back now, it's amazing that I lived through that time. Have some coffee with me sometime, and I'll tell you some of the stories. It's, it, it's astounding. I shouldn't be alive. I shouldn't be free. A couple years ago, I had a motorcycle. Now, I was in my right mind. I was a Christian. Some will argue you weren't in your right mind. I'm too clumsy to, to walk on two feet. I shouldn't be on two wheels. And even with the helmet on, the doctor's like, it's, it's a wonder you're alive. So I can look back. I can be like David and say, if it weren't for the Lord, I'd be dead. Because of my own stupid decisions and things that have happened to me. My Aunt Amy, not Aunt May, Aunt Amy, she's the youngest, and she'll tell you, she's the youngest. She and the rest of the family were in what they called the Day of 100 Tornadoes that ripped through this area in 1974. Pap said, I was at the door when I saw the tornado coming, when I turned around to say get in the basement, everything went up. Pap was laying on the ground after he had been smashed onto the ground. My uncle was over here somewhere with his arm almost severed. And Pap looks up and he says, and Amy was slowly being put down on the ground. And then the top of a, I think it was a chicken coop, the top of, top of a chicken coop, the roof, slowly went down on top of her, and then everything else started going down normal speed. And that chicken coop saved her. Now, my Aunt Amy, I asked her about this this week. I was like, am I getting this story right? She's like, yeah. And in that chicken coop, it was just a, you know, broke down old building. It wasn't like a, there were nails all over the place. She said, not one touched me. My Aunt Amy can look back then and say, if it weren't for the Lord, <laughs> I'd be dead. I would be dead. I was talking to Daniel Browning from Calvin Community Church. Now, some of you are way too young to remember this, but in 1988, there was a flight, Pan Am 103, that was bombed and went down. 270 people were killed in, after it took off from Heathrow in, in Europe. Daniel Browning and I were talking about this psalm this morning, and he says, you know, I was supposed to be on that flight. He was in, in the army, and he was stationed in Europe, and a few weeks before this, his mom starts calling around trying to get in touch with him, and word gets to the first sergeant that he hasn't called mom in like a month and a half. Moms, don't do that if your kids are in the in the service, please. But this was before cell phones. There was no, you know. So, so, Top comes over and says, you need to call your mom. You get over there to the phone and call your mom. So Daniel calls his mom. Hey, mom. You know. And then when he gets done talking to mom, Top says, you need to go see your mom. 
And he already had his reservation to go home for Christmas on flight 103. But his first sergeant said, no, you're going now. And so he went then. And so then one morning, he gets people pounding on his barracks door. It's his friends who were going to go with him, and they say, you got to turn on the TV. That's the plane we were supposed to be on. Daniel Browning says, if it were not for the Lord, I would be dead. I would be dead. Now, most of you have stories like this. If you've lived at any interval of time, you've got stories where looking in from the outside, people would say, certain doom. And yet God has given a miraculous deliverance. Now, here's my question. When that happens, when that has happened, when you look back, does God get the credit? Or do you say, man, this weird thing happened once? Or do you say, let me tell you what God saved me from? David says, let me tell you what God saved me from. Verses 1 through 5 is this really dramatic sort of if then. If this If this hadn't happened, this would have happened. If God, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, then, if then, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. If then, God, if you're not here, I'm dead. But God was there. God was there for all of us who are able to listen to this today. Whether you're here or watching from home, you are here. You exist today because God was there in that time. And when we get to heaven, I'm sure there's going to be a highlight reel of all the times he saved us we didn't even know about. If God hadn't been there, then all would be lost. But God was. So instead of being overcome, look at verses 6 and 7. Instead of being cursed, they were blessed. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. But God. But God. There's a a passage in Ephesians that is probably one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And I know I say that about a lot of passages. But in Ephesians 2, and it's not going to be on the screen. Just write it down or turn there. In Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5, it says, As for you, this is Paul talking to Christians, to the church in Ephesus. As for you, you were, past tense, you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to, past tense, you used to live when you followed, followed, past tense, the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit of the one who is now at work and those who are disobedient. Paul says in verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, past tense. We were gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, past tense, by nature, Deserving of wrath like the rest of mankind. And then verse 4 says, But God, but God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were, past tense, dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
See, when we look at Psalm 124, we can look at it on the surface and say, man, he saved me from drunkenness. He saved me from a motorcycle wreck. He saved me from whatever else your story is. But the most amazing thing that he saved us from is the wrath of God. If I would have been killed in a drunk driving accident, it would have been my fault. I would not get injustice. If I would have been killed in the motorcycle accident, it would have been my fault. I should have known better. If I were to go to hell because of my sins, it would not be unjust of God to do that. Because I have sinned against a holy God. If you were to go to hell, you could not in hell say, this isn't fair. But he has showered us with mercy. He has showered us with grace. He has said, I am not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you life everlasting. Amen? If you look at Psalm 124, don't just be reminded of the physical, worldly things he saved you from. Look up to the most amazing, eternal, spiritual, physical deliverance from sin and the wrath of God. There's a a guy named John Bloom. He writes for Desiring God. He wrote this. He says, but God... These two words are overflowing with gospel. For sinners like you and me who were lost and completely unable to save ourselves from our dead set rebellion against God, there may not be two more hopeful words that we could utter than but God. Once we were dead to any real love for God at all, we were buried under the compounding and disoriented blindness of our sins. But God... The God, once we were deceived by our own lust for glory and self-determination, once we were unknowingly led by the Pied Piper called the Prince of the Power of the Air. But God. Once we lived enslaved to the passions of our flesh, we were driven and tossed between the impulsive waves of our flesh and mind. But God. Once we were God's enemies. The Bible says we hated him. We were children of his wrath. But God. But God. Revel, he says, in these two priceless words. Everything sweet and bitter that will occur between now and the moment of your death, God will work together for your good. When you look at this psalm, don't say, okay, he's delivering me from all this. I must must just be on easy street from here on out. No. He's not going to take you out of the storm. He's just going to take you through it. Amen? And listen, I know what it's like in the storm. I know at times in the storm you're thinking, there's no way I'm getting out of this. The fact that you're here means that he's taken you this far. He won't let you go now. And you might say, I have a loved one who, who loved Jesus and they went through the storm and, and they didn't make it. You might say, Ken, there were Christians on that plane that Daniel didn't get on. So what do you do with that? Here's what I do with that. God still has work for Daniel to do. God was ready to take other Christians home. God still has work for you to do. You're breathing right now because of his grace and also for his glory. You are breathing so that you can breathe out praise and proclamation, Jesus is Lord. Verse 8 says, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. 
Our help is in the name of the Lord. It's not that our help was in the name of the Lord. Like he was there for us, but I don't know, I did these things and now I think he might be just tired of me. Anybody felt like that? Oh, their help is in the name of the Lord. But look, they've got it all together. No, no, no. Again, look at David's life. Look at the life of the Israelites in the Old Testament. They were just as much of a basket case as you are. As I am. And he could say, they could say, our help is in the name of the Lord. But also notice this. Our help is not in the name of a president. Our help is not in the name of the, the, the oil barons across the world who are deciding whether they're going to make up for the difference of Russia. Our help is not in the stock market. Our help is not in the grocery prices. Our help is not in our parents. Our help is not in our friends. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Everything else might be a raging storm. It talks about torrents and floods and waves. But our help is in the Lord. Jesus said, if you hear my words and you take what I say and you put it into practice, the storm's going to come. Just like it's going to come for all your neighbors and all your friends and all your family. The storm is coming. The storm is here. We have Christian brothers and sisters right now who are worshiping with air raid sirens going over their head. The storm is here. And God will keep them to the end. Our help is in the name of the Lord. His name is Jesus. And you, right now, where you are, no matter what you've done, you can trust this Jesus. I don't know, room this big, there might be somebody who, who's never yet trusted Jesus, like really leaned in and said, if you don't catch me, nothing's going to. If that's you, please come talk to me after. But I know there's a lot of Christians in this room, maybe some Christians watching that, that we need to just remind ourselves, I can trust the Lord. I need to stop trying to put my trust in these other things that will be taken away, that will either with malicious intent or just no power, let me down. And I need to trust the Lord. Do you need to trust the Lord today? If you're breathing, you do. If you're eternally going to live somewhere in heaven or hell, you need to trust the Lord. And if you trust the Lord, you can stand. You can stand. He is the one who made heaven and earth. He made every molecule of your body. And he will carry you to eternity. All right. I feel good, but my voice is about gone. So I love you guys. Let's pray. Father God. Lord, I pray that you would just bring to all of our minds today as we go home, as we go to lunch, as we go wherever we're going. I pray that you would just bring to our minds reminders of all the things that you have carried us through. I pray that you would put on our hearts a, an overwhelming torrent, a raging water of gratitude for what you have done and a waterfall of hope for what you are going to continue to do. Lord, I pray that also you would keep on the front of our minds that we are going to die and yet we need not grieve or worry We will live 
boldly for you as long as you allow us and then we will go and see you in glory and worship at your feet and we will find joy in all of it. You are worthy of praise, God. You are worthy of the honor. So much more than what we could give you, you are worthy of all of it. Help us to see your worth. Help us to be so overcome by it that other people want to know about you. It's in Jesus' perfect, precious name that all God's people said. Amen. I love you guys. Next week, next week, God willing, (laughs) next week, lunch.